This is the Foxhole Podcast. My next guest was born in Dallas, Texas, but raised in Virginia. He's a father, husband, and forever a curious soul. He enlisted in the Marine Corps on December 3rd, 2003. He served in three different units over an 11-year career and deployed twice with Tutu Fox Company. After leaving Fox Company, he reported to Officer Candidate School in Quantico, Virginia as an instructor in the Tactics Platoon. Three years later, he reported to Marine Corps Information Operations Center within the Psychological Operations Team, where he finished his Marine Corps career. Paul joined the civilian ranks working with Whitney, Bradley, and Brown, where he was a manager within the Military Information Support Operations Program. He is currently working toward his BS with a double major in marine biology and oceanography. We're going to leave his current career as a little bit of a mystery until we get into the the dialogue with him. So for now, give it up for the great thinker and philosopher, Paul Downs. All right. Well, man, it's my tremendous pleasure to be with you uh, and to have you on the Foxhole podcast, Paul. So thanks. Thanks for taking time to come on. I know you're super busy. Um, and so I want, there's a couple of things I really want to get at today. I want to get at, I'm going to leave it as a mystery right now, where you work and what it is you do there. Um, because I think that is super important to talk about, but I have, I want to do something a little bit different than I've done with other guests that I've had on. I want to just throw out some questions, uh, throw out some words to you. And I want you to just respond to what those mean to you. It could be a couple sentences, could be a whole paragraph, whatever. You'll see where I'm going with this in, in a little bit. So here's word number one, trauma. Trauma. Uh, well, the first word that kind of pops into my mind is gas. Uh, <laughs> well, whether you're my wife or not, that might take a different meaning. <laughs> um, but the, the reason that pops into my head is because, uh, I think oftentimes, um, when we think of trauma, we get caught in this like comparison loop, uh, where it's like, uh, well, my trauma is not as bad or, uh, theirs is more. And the reason I've come up with that word gas is because the reality is, is that trauma is very much like a gas. It's going to fill the shape of the container it's in big, small, large, intense, immense, whatever word you want to try to attach to it in regards to measurement uh, doesn't apply. So it's really just kind of like a, um, it's a very uh, gaseous kind of experience that I think people have with it. And then the second thing uh, that kind of pops into my head, I think most people think of trauma in terms of weakness, like something happened to me. Um, and that's fair. Like a lot of times there's a difference between being a victim and being victimized. Um, but I think a lot of times the reality is that those moments that, uh, cause us to kind of take a step back or to take a step down and just kind of like come to ground are really those moments that actually can build us into something we're supposed to be. Mm. Um, and that's, that's what we really deserve. You know, I think um, I think getting caught too often in that what's happening to me instead of what's happening for, for me uh, really uh, it kind of it sticks us, man. We get lost, can't can't find our way out. Well, I, very good. All right, so I'm just going to park that <laughs> for a second, and I'm going to ask you. Here's the other word: disorder. Disorder. Wow. Um, well, uh, I think um, if you were to look at my sock drawer, um, you would probably find disorder. Uh, but if you were to look at any human, really, it's tough for me to say that there's a disorder. And I think that that's kind of where you're going with that, is that disorder. Um, it gets thrown around a lot. And... Uh, I don't necessarily think that it applies all the time. Um, there are definitely um, some larger, uh, more um, troubling struggles that folks have, but I think put them in a need for a little bit of a higher degree uh, of assistance. But 
I think for the majority of people, that disorder thing is really a label for kind of a, a spiritual searching. You know, people are just looking for something to kind of to feel alive. Like they want to feel like uh, they deserve to live. They want to feel like it's it's a good place to be. Um, and I think that very quickly that disorder thing gets slapped on because people are struggling to find answers uh, um, when in reality they just want to ask better questions. So, um, yeah, I think kind of a short answer to the disorder, but we could go on for a while. And- uh, well, that's a good answer. And I, I, the reason I wanted to ask you about those two words is because those are two things that really – were front and center for me the week that I met you, right? I learned a lot about those two things during that week. And so I'm going to circle back to what those two things, you know, maybe what those two things are in in a different way in a little bit. But I think now is a good time for you, if you wouldn't mind indulging uh, me just a little bit about what is, what is Boulder Crest Foundation? What is Warrior Path? Is it something that fits underneath? that uh, Boulder Crest Foundation, this is, and this is where you work, right? So this is this is why it's important. And it's connected to trauma and disorder in, in, right. in some degree. But could you tell us a little bit more about um, Boulder Crest Foundation? Uh, yeah, I think so. The first part is really kind of the history of the organization itself. Um, and then the second part is my history with Boulder Crest. Um, and Ken and Julia Falk, Ken was a, a 22-year Navy EOD Master Chief. Um, and when he got out of the Navy, uh, founded this company called AT Solutions, uh, sold the company and was living in uh, Bluemont um, and going to school back and forth between um, the DMV and Bluemont. And on the way back from school, he would always stop by the hospital there in, uh, in Bethesda and he would see, uh, he would visit uh, those EOD techs who had lost limbs in the war. And there was a period there. I want to say it was like 72 in a year or something like that. It was crazy number mm. of folks that came back um, without limbs. And on the way back to and from school, he would stop and he'd see these people. And uh, he stopped at one particular uh, young man's room. And it's, he, he always remarks on like the immensity of this room. Like it's just this massive room with like this tiny little hospital bed you know, the sheets and the whizzes and the beeps and all kinds of stuff hanging around this kid, but no people, no, not even any doctors, like just this kid all alone in this room. And he's like, Ken Assey, he's like, where's your family? Like, where is everybody? And the kid kind of looks at him like, like what? Like, Man, my family's rural Tennessee. Like they can't afford to come up here around Washington to stay for the years it's going to take me to rehab. Like, that's not going to work. Uh-huh. And Ken was kind of blown away. Like, well, I mean, have you looked at what resources are there? And then the guy was like, none that I know of. So Ken looked into it himself. And sure enough, there really wasn't anything to kind of bring these families up uh, so that they could be close by at least um, while their loved ones were rehabilitating. And that kind of sparked a, a desire in Ken to kind of fix that problem. And, you know, bomb tech, he's going to fix the problem or he's going to do it. He's going to do yeah. it himself if nobody else spoke. And um, that was kind of the birth of Boulder Crest. And he went home and he kind of talked about it to Julia and went away. And it just kind of like sat in the back of his mind. But he came home uh, one evening from school and he's late at night. He was, you know, night classes. And Julia and a bunch of her friends are hanging around the, the bar uh, at their house, their little, um, I guess you'd call it the island in their kitchen. And there's a couple of bottles of wine and some wine glasses. And, and Ken comes in in a way he describes, it, he's like, I wanted nothing to do with that. He was like, I don't know what was <laughs> happening. But he's like, I screwed at the wall and just tried to go upstairs to my room. Right. And then when you hear Julia tell the story, she's like, yeah, he came in, he slunk along the wall and he was, she was like, no, no, no. It was like, Kenny, come here. <laughs> Get back. And, you know, she, yeah. Right. And she calls him over and she's like, Hey, look, like, I know we've been having, and they had a couple cabins up on their property. It's like a, um, I don't know what you would call it, kind of like a like a garden house and an ensuite. But um, they were having families up there to stay since they didn't have anywhere else for them to do to try to help out. Yeah. Um, and what Julia had kind of realized was that these people, like they couldn't have an argument if they wanted to have an argument. They couldn't kick their feet up. Like they had to take their shoes off at the door. It wasn't their home. 
Yeah. So it was like they couldn't actually be the people they needed to be. Mm-hmm. And Julie was dissatisfied with that. So kind of coupled with what Ken had brought home and that idea, she unveiled to him this idea at that island of turning the bottom 37 acres of their property that they had. It was just hay. That's all they do. They grew hay and they donated it to horse rescue. It was turning that 37 acres uh, into a, an area for some cabins. And the cool thing was it was already zoned for that. So uh, they just had to do a, a few things with the zoning commission in Loudoun. And when uh, Ken presented this idea to some of his friends working in Loudoun go- uh, government, they told him, oh, you'll never get it. Like It's going to take five years plus, like easily, just to kind of get the paperwork pushed through it. And uh, Ken was like, well, he's like, better get started. <laughs> and he went and he visited whoever the... I don't know who the secretary or the commissioner or whoever it was, but this person who we needed to see was an Air Force vet. Uh, he's Air Force combat vet. And when Ken presented this idea to him, the guy was like, well, you know what? Like, I don't know what it's going to take, but uh, I'm going to make sure that this happens for you as fast as we can make it happen. And the people who had told him uh, five years were very surprised when 18 months later they were breaking ground. Um, and then in the next uh, year, they had the three cabins built and they were starting on the launch. So 20, that was 2013. And by the end of 2013, um, the three cabins, the four cabins that you saw, plus the main lodge where we had held all our classes, that was established. Um, it's and incredible. What, it's crazy, man. Yeah. Uh, and each of those cabins was naming rights donations. So uh, one, I think, is sponsored by the state of Pennsylvania. Um, One is the Wallace Annenberg Foundation. Um, There's a few more there that the people just Clark Construction. And these people just donated the money needed to build these cabins. So it was just a one-time donation naming fee. And I mean, it was it was crazy. It just happened like this. And and they're not Um, they're not like you know, rural cabins. These are four right. star. Uh, these <laughs> yeah. are really nice. Yeah. Yeah. So three bedrooms mm-hmm. and they came with an option of a loft, but ADA, like that doesn't really make much sense to have a loft. So <laughs> right. we got rid of it yeah. <laughs> and just lofted the ceilings instead. Yeah, it's really nice. So yeah, man, a uh, three bedroom, they can house a family of eight pretty comfortably. Yeah. Um, it's big. But, uh, it's probably 1200 square feet at least. Right. Yeah. They're big. I think, they seem yeah, big. just about that. Yeah. They seem you know, beautiful, beautiful, quite large. Yeah. Um, but that was kind of the birth of the location. And um, he just started having uh, these special forces families and EOD families coming up to stay so that they could be close to DC with their loved ones while they uh, were in the hospital. Mm-hmm. And um, there was a, an event that Ken was holding at one point just to kind of thank some of the donors and, and some of the people who had been involved in kind of making this thing happen. Um, and he went downstairs in the lodge. Most of the people were upstairs and uh, he went downstairs in the lodge and he went to the right at, at the bottom of the stairs. There's like this little music room. It's got like bongo drums and, uh, it's got all kinds of noise makers, man. Um, but sitting on the couch over there in the corner, this, this woman was just sitting there sobbing and Ken's like, Whoa, man, like what, what on earth? Like, this is supposed to be a celebration. Like what's yeah. happening. So he goes goes over and he sits next to her. And I mean, I've met what I would think to be some really compassionate people. And Ken, I mean, is, is tip top on that list. You know, he's, his heart to help is the biggest I think I've, I've ever met. He's an amazing, amazing man. Um, but he goes over and he sits next to her. He asks her what's going on. He tries to comfort her. And she says, you know, um, I just wish that my husband had lost a limb in the war. And I mean, Ken was having so much experience of sitting next to these people while they experienced that was kind of blown away. Like, that's a terrible thing to wish for. He's like, well, why, why would you want that? Like what? And she's like, well, my husband's attempted suicide multiple times and he's struggling with post-traumatic stress disorder and nobody knows what to do about it. And it's like, he looks fine, but internally he's just, he's not, and there's nothing they can do to help him. So hearing this, uh, Ken had kind of built this thing, trying to fix one problem. And then hearing that, he kind of discovered that maybe there was another problem out there that needed a solution. 
Um, and so he started to travel the country and this was kind of the end of 2013. He started to go around and look and say like, what's, what's going on? Like who's doing anything about this and what does it mean? Um, and the resounding answer was, uh, we don't know. Nothing that we're trying is really working. We've yeah. got like maybe like a 1.8 reduction, 1.8% reduction in symptoms, but it's like these people aren't getting better. The stuff that we're using isn't working. Um, yeah, it was just, he found out nobody, nobody knows what to do. And again, he's like, well, he's like, nobody else. Well, I will. Right. Um, and he started kind of, and the way he tells the story, he's like, I went out and I met with the best of the best and the worst of the best. And just, <laughs> just tried to see like, what could we do about this? And that was, uh, the birth of the warrior path program. And uh, back in that day, I think June 1, 2014 was the first PATH program. Um, and back in those days, it was progressive and alternative therapy for healing heroes, P-A-T-H-H. And um, we've since uh, changed it to progressive and alternative training for healing heroes. Hmm, okay. And yeah, and I think it's a, it's a, it's a yeah. good, unique, it's a small change, but a, but a, but a big one. Yeah. Well, words, words matter and that matters. Yeah. It's a meaningful change. Yeah. Um, and so that was kind of, that was the birth of the path program. And it was, it was just trying to figure out an answer to this post-traumatic stress disorder, uh, mm -hmm. that had kind of swept the country, um, and swept the veteran population and, uh, and past veteran populations. And you look at, um, irritable heart syndrome, right? Shell shock like across like all of these different spectrums of war, you know, it's yeah. like, there's so many different names that it's been given. Right. Um, but yeah, that's, uh, so that's kind of a, you know, I don't know how long that was. <laughs> a, a nutshell. A <laughs> nutshell. Yeah. Well, I, I think that's good because, because what, what, what you hit on, and I think what's really important is this idea of PTSD has been around for a long time and it doesn't seem to be, uh, you know, like anyone had a solution to it. There's everything from, you know, injections to shock therapy to, you know, EDMR, all kinds of stuff that's, that's being done out there. And it doesn't, it doesn't seem like anyone's had a, had a firm grasp on it. Um, and this idea of training, I think is super helpful, right? Cause it's not, it's not as if um, you can't learn to live better. Right. And yeah. For me, that was by the time I met you and there was this invite to go to Warrior Path, I was on this path myself of just how do I fix these little things um, that when you add them all up are almost a mountain I can't overcome, right? I'd, I'd have a little bit of success and kind of step back, have a little bit of success and step back. And for 30 years, I went all kinds of different directions. You know, I've tried everything. Um, but then this notion of training that I could do something that, that I could grab onto, that was almost a physical thing that I could do. Right. Um, I think is, is great. Um, so what was surprised me, and this is gets to that trauma and disorder at post-traumatic stress disorder was that the word disorder wasn't even part of the vernacular, right. When, when I went to Boulder Crest, it was post-traumatic growth and that's the focus and this mm -hmm. idea of growing from trauma. So could you talk a little bit about what, like just what that means, what it means to you, what it means to Boulder Crest? Yeah, man, my head is going so many different places right now. Like, I, <laughs> I, I, I mean, you know this from having met me, like this conversation is like, this is, I think at the core of what saved my life and probably at the core of what I'm curious about. Uh, this, it's such an amazing idea that the things that we struggle with are the things that make us stronger. And if we understand them, we can actually build a platform with them to launch into the life that we deserve. And when they presented that big flowery idea to me in my path program in March of 2015, I said, fucking prove it. <laughs> like you don't get to drop that in front of me and walk away. Like you, you got to tell me why. And then how do I know I'm in it? Like great post-traumatic growth sounds amazing, but how do I know I'm in it? 
And uh, the amazing thing that I experienced at, at, at PATH was nobody, nobody gave me necessarily a solution. They just said, like, this is what I found out. And I hope you find your own answer. Like, when you figure it out, come back and tell us. I was like, wait a minute. Like, you're not going to give me an answer? They're like, well, that is it. It's, you, it's what fits you best. And so I kind of went out like these past six years, I've tried to prove this process wrong and I can't, can't do it. Um, and this idea of post-traumatic growth, that what doesn't kill you makes you stronger, a very Nietzschean idea. It's like this, this thing that kind of pushes you to your limits can make you stronger is unique in that it doesn't focus <clears throat> on the symptoms. It doesn't focus on uh, what's wrong. It just focuses on what happened and then kind of what do you want to do about it? Like, got it. Like this thing happened. Okay. Well, let's look at it objectively. Don't like get sucked into it. Don't mire yourself down in it. You lived it once. We don't need to do it again. You yeah. know, yeah. like now, okay. What are you thinking about it? What, what questions are you asking? Where have you gone? Is it like, where do I belong? You know, uh, what's my purpose? Um, who am I? And, you know, all those big existential questions are the things that are going to help energize us to figure out what we want to do about it, you know? And um, when I left PATH, I kind of realized that who I am question had been the real big one that had been burning in me. And the answer that I came up with was that I am a father, I'm a shepherd and a storyteller. And uh, within those three things, um, it's kind of like, so who does that person then do? Or what do they do? Right? Who, who are they? How do they act? Uh, what do they believe in? What are they passionate about? Um, and those were the things that I started to kind of explore. And that was kind of the beginning of the transition into uh, going from kind of that mentality of post-traumatic stress disorder where there's something wrong and I kept focusing on what was wrong to this idea that there's nothing wrong. There's just something that happened or some things. And all I need to do is figure out who I am because of it. And what do I, what does that person do? Who are they? How do they act? Um, and those three things that I believe about myself, father, storyteller, and shepherd, um, those kind of help guide me, uh, as I, as I've tried to figure this out, as I try to figure out like, what's, uh, what's the next thing, you know, what am I, what's the next right thing? Um, big, big things. Like you were talking like 20 years and also like momentary things, you know, like what's the, what in the next two, two minutes, you know, the next five minutes sitting in traffic, right? <laughs> like who's, who's a father, a shepherd and a storyteller going to be sitting in 270 traffic, right? <laughs> like, yeah. I don't know, man. It's, it's, yeah. Well, uh, you said something there. I think that you said a couple of things there that, that are, I want to highlight a little bit. You said early on, it's not about what's wrong, but what happened. Right. And I think this is where it's at that part in the road <laughs> where a lot of us have gone down the wrong path or, or have seen our journey in the wrong, from the wrong lens. Right that it the focus is on what's wrong with us right and for my cadre of veterans that I deal with mostly it's revolves around gulf war illness or toxic exposures right so those guys have been dealing with that for 30 years and it is a it is something that's on their mind all the time this is what's wrong i now have this right. disorder I, I now have this disease i now have this problem m intermixed with post traumatic PTSD, post-traumatic stress disorder. But the value in that journey, the things that you've experienced through your deployment, through your service, um, and through struggling through whatever illness it is you have, and it's it's broad for a lot of veterans. There's, it's what they're, I think what I missed out on for a lot of years was 
what do I, what did I bring to the table to other people? What did I bring to the table for my family? What did I bring to the table for my friends? Given I had those experiences, given I learned how to struggle, given I got up every single day, regardless of how much tired it was, how painful it was, like the, that hard thing gave me, made me hard, right? Made me stronger, but I never saw it from that lens. Not until I went, you know, until I experienced warrior path. Um, and so I wonder if you had any thoughts on that, just that whole idea of it's not what's, it's not what, what, what about what's wrong with you, but what happened and, and then taking that what happened and, and forging a path forward based on that. Yeah. Um, you know, I, I, that idea was kind of the, that it's not what's wrong, it's what's happened. That to me was the big paradigm shift um, in kind of, you know, how am I living? And here, so something I want to make sure we, we kind of make clear. Um, and I want to use the example of the, the men from the Hanley Hill um, and uh, Operation Homecoming. I want to say it was in 1971 or something like that, uh, where they repatriated uh, all the men and women that had been in the Hanley Hill uh, anywhere from, I think it was three months to eight years. And that's three months to eight years of like abject torture. Um, your skin falling off because of the boils that keep bursting because you haven't had a shower or been able to clean yourself in eight years. You know, the bamboo getting shoved underneath your, your fingernails, you know, bones broken, like whatever, literally some of the worst torture you can imagine. Okay. And uh, what was interesting was that the, the doctors who were kind of bringing these people home were telling their families, like, they're going to be uh, husks. You know, they're going to be the shadow of the person that you knew before. Um, most of them will probably be infantile. Like you won't really be able to tell that these are the people that you knew before. Um, and what was interesting was that the reality was uh, that, that most of the folks that came home actually came home better uh, than they had before. And yeah. currently what we're seeing in kind of post-traumatic stress percentages is about 30% of folks uh, are diagnosed with the symptoms of post-traumatic stress. Those uh, 491 people that came home, I think it's 491. I got that number from somewhere. <laughs> somewhere around, there's a couple hundred people that came home from the Hanoi Hilton. 4% of those people who had been there from three months to eight years demonstrated the symptoms of post-traumatic stress. And uh, the interesting thing was it was the people who had been there uh, the shortest amount of time that demonstrated the symptoms the most. And the question was like, well, why? Like, why on earth in this place where you would think like you would have 100%? It doesn't matter if you're there two days, you would have 100% of the symptoms of post-traumatic uh, stress. And they had this code that they kind of lived by, led by uh, Stockdale, and, and some of the other folks that were in there. Um, the, the rule number one, return- You're talking about Admiral Stockdale. Right, yes, yes. Admiral Stockdale. Um, number one, return with honor. Not return to honor. Honor wasn't somewhere else. Yes. Like it was return with it. You had it already. It yeah. was yours for the taking. And uh, you were going to bring it back with you. Um, the other thing that they did, which I think and to me, this step is incredibly important. Um, they disclosed what they were ashamed of. The ones who were there uh, very recently when they were captured and tortured, of course, they thought to themselves, I'm not going to give anything up. You know, I know the creed. I know the soldier creed. Like, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to be a good prisoner of war. I'm not going to give away any secrets. And they gave away every single secret. Right. And yeah. And they go back to their. Yeah. Right. right. Like. Like you're going to break, you know, yeah. and, and these people would go back to their cells and hate themselves. Yeah. And they felt such shame for betraying their countrymen and the people who were there with them because they assumed nobody else did break. Right. Right. And that's an interesting concept of trauma. That's what it does to us. It makes us feel very alone. Yes. Um, but what these people did is they had this little scratching system, this little tap system where certain numbers of taps stood for certain letters. And in the letters, you spelled out sentences. And um, in the uh, in this story, um, and I'm, oh man, I just lost the name of the book. 
Anyway, uh, in the story, uh, these men would go back to their to their cells, and the uh, they would uh, inevitably hear this little scratching. And initially, they would ignore it because they thought it was some mouse or something. And then finally, when it kept persisting, they would try to find it in their cell. They'd try to see where it came from. And what it was was it was the people next to them trying to get them to communicate with them and to tell them about how ashamed they were to talk about and to disclose uh, the things that they were ashamed of. Yeah. And doing that gave them kind of a, a freedom to realize, number one, they're not alone. Because their response, once they said they broke, was, yeah, we did too. We all did. Yeah. Welcome like, to the club. Like, yeah. You're getting tortured. <laughs> of course you broke. Yes. Um, and they just threw all of this stuff and, and the leadership and everything that was there, they returned that. Now, the point with that story, and what I want to make sure we make clear is that, yes, there were admirals and generals and Fortune 500 company leaders, Fortune 100 company leaders, uh, and, and amazing people that came out of this incredible, uh, terrible event. And those people sometimes slept on the floor of their kitchen because it was more comfortable. They struggled to hold relationships because they weren't sure how to relate to people. And it's like, if, if we get too caught up I think, in the uh, glorification of the best end of post-traumatic growth, we miss the point of post-traumatic growth. So we have to be able to say, yes, both exist. They have to, because if one doesn't, I don't get the other. These people who slept on their kitchen floors were leading companies of people for years into, into billions of dollars, leading congress leading armies you know and it's like that's that's the power of post-traumatic growth it's not saying that gulf war syndrome isn't a real thing it's saying yes it's a real thing and what else it's like okay yeah it's like life might be really difficult right now and maybe this thing isn't necessarily going to go away so what do i do about it how do I live with it? And who do I get to become because this reality exists for me? Right. Not how do I Heisman this thing? So that, <laughs> right. you know what I mean? Like, yeah. And you're how, not ever going back to. Right. It, it's not about going to where you were. It's no. where, are, where are you going? What, where is your, what is your new present? You know, what's the new now? Versus, you know, I can think about the past all I want. I was this athlete and I did X, Y, and Z and I can't do that anymore. But what am I doing now? Right. Right. And I, something you said that I think, I don't mean to cut you off here, but um, I, I want you to kind of weave this in if you can, this idea of choice, right? And at the Hannah Hilton, mm. those guys lived by that notion of choice. Like they, they had their own little rebellions, you know, how they kind of fought right. the propaganda machine and how they behaved Flags. in the prison camp. It was all about choice. And Viktor Frankl talks about that same, same type of thing when he's in the, he's in the prison, uh, Nazi prison camps, right? Like it's a, the worst situation you can possibly imagine, but you still have some choice. You have a choice on whether or not you smoke the cigarette or not smoke the cigarette. Right. <laughs> right. Cause yes. he knew that when people smoke the cigarette, they were done. Right. They're, they were going to, yeah. that was like, that was like their step out the door. They're going to die next. Um, but we all have that. That's the, like, that's the power of your day to day, right? It's the choice, the choice of how you perceive your situation, the choice of whether you're going to get up and go out the door and soak in some sun. Um, so I'm, you know, I'd like, I'm just curious, well, let me say this from the moment I met you, right. That like the first five words out of your mouth, I'm like, this guy is a deep thinker. He's, <laughs> he thinks a lot about things. You were very intentional and very, you know, um, it was clear that you just thought about what you were going to say. And so I really want to hear your perspective on this idea of what you're talking about now and, and post-traumatic growth and, and this inter interwoven with choice and how important that is to the process. Um, the first and, thing, and really quick, because it's not just about yeah. veterans too. This is like for any, this is like yeah, anyone's everybody. life, right? Anyone's yeah. life. Yeah. Yeah. And I, that's number one. That's the thing I love about post-traumatic growth is it's, it's democratized. Like it's every, it's like, um, uh, yeah, it's like, I am post-traumatic growth and so can you, you know what I mean? It's like, it's everybody, <laughs> yes. right? 
And so number one, what I want to say about choice is that I think there's two different ways of doing it um, in terms of reacting and in terms of responding. Mm. And I think they're two different, very important variations. Um, when I uh, was a kid, um, I was sexually molested by my mom from age nine to about 16. And outside my house, uh, I had to know who everybody was. I had to know where I was going. I had to know what colors they were wearing. I had to know who was who because if I didn't, it wasn't, it wasn't safe for me. Inside the house, I had to know where mom was because if I didn't, it wasn't safe for me. Right? And it was like all of these, and there were great things there as well. My mom read to us every night before we went to bed. And from that, I have this insatiable uh, love of language and expression and art. And, um, and also because of that relationship that I had with my mom, I now know how to create the opposite. And I value relationships uh, very deeply because I know how important they are. Uh, so it's all there, right? Mm. But needless to say, as I grew up, I didn't know any of that. And I was kind of just built collecting all of these things across the spectrum as i was getting older you know there were good things there were bad things and just started to get filled up like i started to fill up i like to think of us kind of like uh like these big porcelain bathtubs you know like we're just we're just these massive containers right and as we go through life it's like these drops these water drops just kind of get they get dripped into the into the tub some of them are really gr nasty, grimy water, and some of them are really beautiful, you know? And, and eventually the tub fills up. And depending on kind of your situation and how you were living and what's going on, it fills up faster or slower, depending, right? Anyway, anyway tra trauma, think trauma, like it's going to fill it up, right? Mm, I got you, okay. And yeah, uh, some of us have a capacity to kind of just really like tamp it down, right? Uh, which bigger boom. Um, but... I was left without a capacity um, to respond to what was going on around me. And I'd also been trained very well to react quickly. I had to react quickly inside the house because if I had to figure it out, it'd be, be fast, you know, and outside, you know, you see the right colors or the wrong colors. You got to react quickly. You got to know the difference between MS-13 and just somebody else, right? Mm -hmm. I had to right. move. I had to be quick. And then 11 years in the Marine Corps, trained very quickly, violence of action, infantry. So it's like, yeah, you got to be fast. And because I was actually good at it prior to the Marine Corps. But then getting out of the Marine Corps and rejoining a, uh, a society that doesn't operate that way. You know, going from a 0.45% of 1% of the population that sees combat back into a population where the 99.99% exist. Nine six percent, whatever it is, it's like that wasn't that wasn't useful anymore, and I was still reacting when everybody else around me is kind of reacting, but much slower. And it was like that choice to react quickly started to destroy a lot of the relationships around me, including my relationship with myself. Going through path, one of the opportunities that I had, and I know you you had this as well. It's, uh, it's kind of a build up from the day one all the way until this day uh, is a massive opportunity for disclosure. And it kind of happens uh, over the course of the whole uh, seven days. And we hope over the course of the rest of our lives. Um, but that third day, I got to talk about everything that I had remembered happening to me as a kid. I got to kind of lay it out very objectively, the red symbolizing the traumas and the blue symbolizing the gifts. And I got to kind of see the algorithm that sat squarely on the other side of the equal sign for me. And at the end of that day, uh, after I kind of wrote out this big uh, geneogram, um, and I, I drew, and I think it's an important thing, you get to draw a green line on it where all the, the traumas uh, stop and the gifts get to kind of filter through. It's almost like a sieve, right? It's a very metaphorical line um, because it's also a choice. Yeah, it's like the cheesecloth yeah. where all the goodness comes through. The, yeah, the yeah, cloth. right. <laughs> I love cheese, man. So it's a good analogy. <laughs> uh, but that, if you want to talk about choice, that's that green line represents the regaining of freedom of choice. Mm -hmm. It represents the regaining of 
the ability to respond instead of react. Mm -hmm. And at the end of that day, I got to throw it in the fire and burn it and then commit to doing one thing differently. And the thing that I said I was going to do, and it's amazing, I can't believe it just remembered this, um, I was going to be kind to myself. And because uh, I guarantee you, and this is still something I'm working very hard on, uh, but nobody can be as mean to me as I can. You know, and that's, that was something I really needed to do. But that choice to be more kind to myself over the past six years has helped me to do the other kind of choosing, which is to respond. Now, uh, it's funny because I was talking with Stephanie, my wife, about this actually just yesterday, uh, where um, that ability to respond is still after six years, and it's pretty good. It's not a long time, you know, it's maybe dropping a bucket considering, but it's, it's six years alive for me. Uh, but that six years, I'm, I'm gradually getting to the point where I can kind of see me doing it. You know, I can see ahead of time and be like, oh, I've kind of been here before. I can feel this. Ang I got this angry feeling. Okay. I'm kind of, I'm getting a little tense. It's like, maybe instead of what I know the reaction is going to be, why don't I take a breath, step back. And that gives me this kind of internal space to be able to look at things very deliberately and say, what's important? Like, what am, why, why am I thinking this? And how do I really want to respond in this moment? Um, and that difference between that immediate, let me, let me just go quickly and let me just see what I could do and what's, what, what do I actually really, who do I want to be as a father, a shepherd, a teacher, and a, and a, and a storyteller? Like who, who, what is that person going to do? That response versus react is kind of what we gain when we start to disclose those things that we really struggle with um, because it starts to create space, you know, but we all, everybody's got that power, you know, and if we focus too much on what's wrong, we reduce our ability to respond because then we're just focusing on this negative song that we keep playing in our head and that wears us down. Like that sucks and it's not a fun thing to hear in your head. So it's like once we kind of like, shake it out and clean the cheesecloth off, you know what I mean? So it actually can filter. Uh, then we kind of regain that ability to, uh, to choose to respond instead of reacting. Um, and so let me, let me ask you something because uh, you, yeah. you said something that was really important that I hadn't really thought about before. And I want to make sure I understood it correctly. What you, I, and correct me if I'm wrong, I think what you said was, through this process of disclosure, you, you get additional space because you kind of get that weightiness off of you. That's kind of how I'm hearing that, right? You get this, whatever your disclosure happens to be, right? Whether, you know, whatever happens to be, you get more space. And by having that more space, mental space, you're able to respond to other situations better versus react to them, right? And, and I'll say this, that, did I understand that correctly? Yeah. Cause that's super important. I don't think I ever made that connection that, that having that, dis, that dis, getting the, having the disclosure gives me, you know, larger margins, having larger margins gives you opportunities to respond rather than just react uh, to something. And I don't think I, I don't think I ever made that connection fully. I think I had those two things separate independently, <laughs> but they were never put, I didn't see the, I didn't, I had never had them joined together there, which I think's, for me, but one of the biggest things that, that came, you know, growth things for me that came out of Warrior Path was that, that just being able to respond versus react. Because I could definitely feel, you know, well, what would happen before is I would just be reacting to something like my son said or did, right? And I'm in, I'm in the middle of the reaction, almost at the end of it. And I'm like, what a jerk. Uh, what a, yeah. I, and it's too late. I can't bring it back. I can't take the words back. I can't take the actions back. But now it's like, you know, here's who, who I think I should be, who's who I think I am, you know, based on what I, what my goals are. All right, here's an opportunity to be a better father, to be a better husband, to be a better son, whatever happens to be, right? Now I yeah. see that as an opportunity to respond. Okay, we don't need to hurry up and get X done. Let's just have a teaching moment here. 
they don't know how to swing an ax. Let me show them how to swing an ax. And then that turns into an ax game, right? Okay, guess what? The wood didn't get all chopped up in like 45 minutes, which I thought I had. But what did I gain? Well, what I gained was these memories with my boys, these memories of, you know, teaching them how to swing an ax, you know, and we played a game. All right. What, what did I really lose? <laughs> nothing. Yeah. I lost nothing. So thanks for pointing that out. Cause I think that is, that is huge. Um, and just how you, how you couch that and, uh, and definitely something for me because I didn't, I hadn't made that connection fully there. Great. Yeah, man. I love it. And you know, what's, <laughs> what's really crazy about that little idea is that it is very much a hindsight kind of thing. You know, you don't really know. It's like, um, it's like if you, you have this really difficult conversation that you're having in your head that you want to have with someone else. And you're kind of like just mulling this thing over and you're just playing it over and it just keeps getting bigger and bigger, right? Like the, the more you kind of narrate it in your mind, the more it kind of becomes this like, it's like the bestseller of your brain, right? It's like everybody's reading it. It's like, uh, it just gets big. And when you go and you finally, you have this conversation or you just talk about whatever it is with somebody who you care about. And when it gets out, it's just like, it's like this little thing. And it feels so good to just get that little breath out. And it's like, oh my God, like, like I, I can think of times where I've literally, I've literally slept better because I, I just let this thing out. Yeah, I took the dog for a walk. You know what I mean? Like, I put it on the leash. I walked outside. I gave it some fucking air. And I said, <laughs> "Like, great, like, get get it out. Don't own it so much." And it's it's really cool because it's like it's hard to kind of that's it's <laughs> this is a tricky thing about post traumatic growth is that it, it's hard to see when you're in it because when you're in it, you're usually either struggling or you're doing really well. And if you're doing really well. Then you kind of, it's hard to like, no, because it's like, yeah. oh, well, everything's great. So yeah, you're you know, in utopia. When, all right. <laughs> yeah, right. It's like, why would I think about anything else? And I'm uh -huh. doing great. Uh, and then when you're struggling, usually it's like you're focused on that struggle. Um, but it, it, it's just, it's such a like, just this awesome opportunity and th that capacity to kind of just use the space provided. Uh, whether it's a long space or a short space uh, is is an amazing gift that that, that post-traumatic growth gives, that disclosure gives. Yeah. Um, I think we use the analogy of like the rookie quarterback versus the pro quarterback. You know, it's like they you take the same 2.3 seconds for both people and the rookie quarterback feels like they have like zero seconds, <laughs> whereas the pro quarterback feels like they've got like 30 minutes. Right. Like they can see things almost in slow motion. It's like, that's the kind of the, it's not an end state, but it's really kind of the, the byproduct, I would say, of uh, very courageously and, and vulnerably sharing uh, these things that we struggle with, you know, the things that we talk about and, and think about in our own heads. Um, that, yeah. that capacity to use the space. I would add to that, that, I, that, the, that the, the veteran quarterback has years of training right and mm -hmm. that this stuff just isn't it's not a switch that you flip right that it takes right. practice and it takes effort and it takes doing hard things right all of this stuff that you've been talking about isn't it's not easy right it's a it's a, it is truly a struggle and it's a it's a, these are hard things yeah. and so maybe that's my next question for you well, like what's the value in doing these things what's the value in doing hard things i mean i like doing hard things physically but these are hard things mentally too right and yeah. having the conversation that you know you need to have that you've been avoiding <laughs> right and then preparing yeah. yourself for that okay what might be said in this conversation what might what are the, what are my triggers going to be that I know. And how do I just set those aside? Cause I, I know I need to have this conversation. Right. Right. So this is something else that's come for me since warrior path, right? Those sorts of things. Right. All right. What's going to, you know, I would just think about, okay, I need to do this. Well, I never thought about all of the, you know, as many scenarios as I could. Okay. What does my, <laughs> I'm talking about my wife, right? This, she might say this, well, I, I'm going to draw my sword for battle. Well, what's right. that going to get me? Nothing. That gets yeah. me nowhere, right? If my son starts to smirk when I'm giving him a lecture, some unsolicited advice. Um, I know 
what's that smirk about? I know he's nervous. He's not being disrespectful. There's a difference, right? So I just need to, how am I going to respond when I see that? So I wonder if you will just comment a little bit about that, that doing hard things, like the value of that. I mean, and, and if you want to tie it to physical things too, please do. Cause I know when we're talking about post-traumatic growth, you have been talking about it. We're talking about a lot of different techniques from physical yeah. th strengths to um, mental strengths, to financial strengths, to, you know, kind of spiritual strengths. So these, all these things sort of fit into, into this bigger picture of, of wellness and, and, and growth. Um, there's, a, I, I said it, I think two programs ago, and I had to say a lot of stuff, and you know, that, um, and, but this one, I was like, wow, it was like, that's actually really cool. Like, I want to remember that. Uh, but what I said was, I was like, don't do big shit, do little shit in a big way. And I'm sure somebody has said it before. Uh, but it was like, there's the first time I like, it just came to me. I was like, that's, this is, this is meaningful. And this, this, this needs to be in this moment. Um, and that's kind of what I want to say in terms of doing hard stuff. I think in terms of usually when, when we think of like, uh, like what's hard to do, we think really big, you know, and that's one of the beauties, the, the amazing things of kind of being human is we think in huge terms and we're like, we want to create, we want to make massive things. And, and, and I mean, we have, but there's this element of doing uh, the next right thing um, that I think is sometimes harder than just going out and attempting a big thing. Um, and just, <laughs> I'll use a, a little example. Um, my wife, Steph, uh, back. So when I first moved up to Boulder Crest, I, I, I was looking to buy a house and, I put an offer in and the offer was accepted and we were going through the process. My lending agent went on a vacation uh, and I lost that house because nobody knew where she was, couldn't get any of the paperwork done. And as I transitioned jobs, I went from about 160 to much less than that, about 52. So I, I knew I had to do the loan on the 160, you know, so it's like, then I just budget really well. Um, and <laughs> I had nowhere to live. So, uh, Steph's parents offered me to move in with them and with Steph. And while we were living there, we're very good at noticing people's patterns. You know, we're just trained to do it, right? And uh, one of the patterns that Steph had was she would put her wallet and her keys on the end of the, the bar in their kitchen before she was going out to do whatever errand she was doing. And I left that morning and I knew that she was going out because her keys and her wallet were there. And when I came home, uh, they hadn't moved. And that was really weird because that told me that she hadn't left uh, or something happened, you know, and it was, I could go, right. This is the respond react thing. Right. Mm -hmm. So I could go into the other room, you know, ready to go, like guns drawn, ready to <laughs> right. fight, whatever thing, right, right. you know, uh, or what I could do. And what I did was I just kind of took a step back and I was like, well, just because you're noticing doesn't necessarily mean um, anything happened. Right. So don't you get amped up? Like there may already be enough people that are amped up in the, in the house. Like, why don't you just take a second, take a breath and be maybe a calming force instead of an escalating force. Yeah. Um, and I went into the, into the, the living room and Steph was sitting there on the couch watching TV and she had a blanket and she had ramen noodles. And I was just like, Oh man, like, like that's just something's up. Right. So again, what do I do? Like go like, you know, hard or do I go gentle? Like, what do I, how do I do it? And I chose gentle and I just sat down next to her. I just kind of grabbed her and pulled her in. I was like, Hey, was like, what's going on? I, like, I noticed your keys are still in the same place. And she just starts crying. She had a massive fight with her mom. And if it had been you know, like the other way, if I'd have gone into fix, if I'd have gone in to, you know, change something or make it better, make it something that it should have been in my mind, I probably would have made it much worse because it would have been about me. It wouldn't have been about her. I would have been trying to correct something because I would have been focused on a problem, a disorder. And instead, it's like you just take the second to step back, do the hard thing and just step back and not be, which we're really good at, the fixer, you know, which tells people like, I'm, I know more than you do. I'm better at this than you are. I'm better at the relationship with your mother than you are. 
<laughs> but that's what I would have said. And it was like, through my actions, it's like, that is the hard stuff that we're talking mm. about. Not, you know, going out and, and diving down, you know, 2000 feet. Like, <laughs> you know what I mean? Like not yeah. like starting yeah. a nonprofit on a leper colony. Like, like we're talking about literally the, this, these, these difficult interpersonal and personal relationship items because at the end of the day whether or not i'm diving down 2000 feet or starting a nonprofit in a leper colony i still got to work with people and i still got to work with myself so if i can do these really small things in a big way to try to create a relationship with myself and with others that's worth having then i can go do those things with much more of a of a motivation and an impetus to come back from them. You know, it's like sometimes when I was uh, before PATH, I would go do big things and I would want to stay there. Mm. Like I would just like, I would yeah. go, you know, go fishing, go somewhere, just be like, I just want to stay here because I don't want to come back. Right. You know, and it's like. Because the hard think, things are back there. Right. Yeah. <laughs> the really but small hard things are back there. Right. Yeah. yeah. And it's yeah. like I said earlier, like nobody can be as mean to me as I can. And one of the things that I'm practicing that's really, really difficult for me, um, because you know, when you said it, I think a lot. I think about a lot of things, which is mm -hmm. a good thing. Yeah. But it's also, I, I, everything gets thought about. <laughs> you know what I mean? Right. It's like, I yes, just I think relate about to it. that. Yes. Yeah. And I'm working on not owning it so much. I'm working mm -hmm. on not narrating it so much in my head um, and kind of in a way kind of disassociating, you know, from those moments instead of using like the words I and me and mine, like I'm like, it's like, it's my thing that I want to have and hold. Uh, I get to say, well, look at that. That's a, that's a, that's a, that's an angry feeling, you know? Oh, okay. That's a, a lustful feeling. Oh, okay. That's a, that's a sad feeling. You know, and I get to kind of label them that way and see it because that helps me to then be able to predict where I'm going because mm -hmm. I can, it pops up again, you know? Okay. Yeah. But when I, yeah. But when I kind of narrate the big thing, it gets cloudy. Yeah, I can't see the, the little, I can't see right way through it. Because you're, it's like you're, you're, you're seeing it from a different vantage point, right? One is like more of a strategic view of, you can kind of see it from outside versus when you're, when you're, it's like your first person versus third person. It's kind of a, an interesting, an interesting view. Yeah, it's difficult. Something you said that I think is worth uh, pointing out that I think is really important is uh, it, when you were talking about this event where you came home and saw the keys, that you had to make this hard choice of how to, how to address it, right? And I could be full guns blazing or I could be gentle. Well, this notion that we sometimes, this, this was me for a long time, right? That I didn't, I never saw the word gentle as being something hard to do. <laughs> right? I never like, oh, you know, you can't, you can either be one or the other. You either be gentle or you're, you know, full guns blazing. And that's not necessarily true. And I think for, especially men that sometimes having that, taking that gentle approach or taking that empathetic approach or taking that loving approach or taking that intentional approach with your significant other, those are the harder things than to just, well, I'll do it myself or don't worry about it. I got it, you know, and then right. damaging a relationship in the, in the process of doing that. So yeah. I just wanted to, I just wanted to highlight that. Cause I think that for me, that is super important that seeing things that are gentle or intentional are, are hard. Those are hard things too. And you, you should see yeah. them as hard and, and, you know, and, and do hard things. Yeah. <laughs> do more of those hard uh, things. Right. You know, do those little things, do little things in a big way. Um, one of the books, uh, and I, I love like audio books and YouTube. And uh, one of the books that I just found on YouTube is Lao Tzu's, uh, the book of the way, Tao Te Ching. And hmm. okay. in that book towards the end, uh, he says this thing where he says, um, the old man, at the end of his life, uh, he dies and he turns stiff. And the grass, when it's green, it bends and it blows in the breeze. And when it dies, it turns stiff. And he said, trees, as they age and they die, they turn stiff. 
he said, so flexibility and gentleness yeah. is a friend of life and stiffness, yeah. a friend of death. Yeah. <laughs> Stay away from death. Like, yeah. And it's <laughs> Don't like, be rigid. It's, yeah. I mean, I like, I got goosebumps, you know, it's yeah. like, <clears throat> it's so important. Just such an, it's, it's gentle is strength, pliability, flexibility. Yeah. Like, yeah. And it, dude, if you just want to talk about the gym, like if that's true, the other is too. If you need to warm up before you go to the gym, yeah, then warm up before you have a difficult conversation. Yeah. You know, like mm -hmm. we don't even go straight into it because you lose out when you do that. You lose what you could gain. Just shit works for the gym. You lose what you could gain. It works for a conversation. You lose what you could gain. If you don't warm up for it, don't take a step back. Call a friend. Say, hey, dude, like this is what I'm thinking. I'm kind of made this thing big. Here's what's going on. Like, have a conversation about it. Mm -hmm. And maybe call more than just one person. You know? <laughs> get, a, get a perspective. Yeah. Yeah. A broad perspective. Have a, a wide breath. Yeah, yeah, that is so important. Hugely important, important man. Yeah. All right. I, I did say earlier that I thought you were, and, and, and that what I, one of the things I really appreciate and, and, uh, and admire about you is your, your sort of philosophy, right? These big thinker ideas. And I don't want, <laughs> I don't want this because I don't get this like private conversation with you all the time. Right. So yeah. I, I want to ask you about something that I'm assuming you've been thinking about because just knowing that you're Paul Downs, right. And you think about these sorts of things. I want you to, uh, I want you to tell me what, like, what your ideas are about consciousness. Like, what is it? Where is it? Where does it come from? Where does it go? You know, and here, and I'll just set that up with this. Like, you know, I'm conscious. I know I have consciousness, or I know what that is. I know it probably exists kind of, I kind of assume it's in my brain somewhere. Do you? And sometimes it might be in my heart, you know, so I kind of go between these two things. It's kind of my soul and my heart. And what is my soul? Anyway, there's consciousness, right? And, and, and this idea that consciousness is this potential energy, right? It's just a potential. And it's when I take some action that I bring it from this potential energy into something else in reality. I know if, like, if I had I had a couple surgeries last year, I go on, under anesthesia, I'm unconscious. I'd, I've lost my consciousness, but when I find myself awake, my consciousness seems to be back. So where did it go? Did it <laughs> did it hover above me? Anyway, I, you know, I don't want this time to go without me asking this question about consciousness to you. Okay. And your thoughts? Um, I um, <laughs> yes, I have most definitely thought about this. <laughs> I'm surprise, surprise. <laughs> a lot, uh, and I kind of in my, in my kind of search to kind of figure out what really is or is not uh, consciousness. Um, and then it kind of, what does it mean to me? Uh, I, I really, I turned to a lot of different uh, places to try to learn what people had already kind of looked at. Right. Um, and I think one of the things that I've come to uh, believe, I'll say believe, um, because it, I have a, I have a difficult time saying fact, you know, because I, I know what I know. The one thing I think I know is that everything I've known or believed has changed. So it's like, it's very difficult for me to say fact. Mm -hmm. uh, gravity is a fact right now. Who knows later <laughs> mm -hmm. may not be a fact, uh, yeah. but so it's, it's at least part of the physical laws we know. Right. Yeah. Uh, so far. So far. May not work with quantum and laws. I kind of think that's, that's kind of one of the things <laughs> I want to talk about with consciousness. Right. And man, we could go, oh boy, we could go into, oh man. Okay. Consciousness. All right. Yes. Uh, so one of the people that I listened to a lot, uh, Joseph Campbell, um, and he talked about this a little bit in his book, uh, Power Myth, uh, his conversation with, with Bill Moyers. And Campbell had this little uh, house in uh, Hawaii with his wife. And um, on their porch, their lanai, they had this, uh, these vines that grew up the, the posts on the, on the porch. And every morning when the sun came up, all these leaves would kind of turn over towards the sun uh, to soak up the, the vitamins from the sun and, and the photon and all this stuff. Okay, So they get warm and start photosynthesis and all these things. 
Um, and then in the evening, as the sun set, they would change and the flowers would open and go towards the sun. And he says in his book, you can't tell me that's not consciousness. He said, you can't tell me that in, in a way, this plant knows the direction of the sun. And he's like, whether or not it thinks the way we do, or whether or not it feels or, or uh, describes or it, you know, characterizes itself the way we do, doesn't mean that that's not conscious. And what I think uh, is really interesting is it's like, when you, let's just think about this kind of in objective terms, almost like a Lego set. Think of your building, your, your body is a Lego set, right? Um, you, you remove an organ, okay? That organ uh, stops working because it's not in, in where the rest of it is. It'll die, it'll rot, it'll kind of disintegrate, right? But then if you were to like preserve it and then put it back in, it starts working again and it starts yeah. functioning yeah. in the manner that it's kind of supposed to function. So is it conscious? It knows uh, I, I do this and, and this is my function and this is where I fit. And this is how this thing goes. You know, you take your, your finger and you pull your finger off and it's like, it, it, it's still a finger, but it'll probably rot and disintegrate, and, but you preserve it, put it back on. It is a finger, right? It will continue to be a finger and it continue to be part of your hand. I think that where we get caught is that we think consciousness is a function of thought. We think consciousness is a function of uh, what I know, what I believe, what I've experienced, uh, I think consciousness is something uh, much bigger than that. I don't know necessarily exactly how I could define it, but I know it when I see it. And I think we all know it when we see it. Um, and it, it's like, uh, I don't know necessarily uh, whether without consciousness you could think I don't know. I mean, that's a, it's an interesting proposition, supposition. Can we think without consciousness? I don't know. Um, maybe uh, that plant uh, on the lanai, uh, Joseph Campbell and his wife, uh, thought, but maybe it just didn't think the way we think. So we right. don't think. We don't have an understanding of how it thinks or. Right. And because we don't, we say that it doesn't, you know, and it's like, um, I, yeah, it's such a, such a strange thing. I just, I think consciousness is more of a collective, less of a personal uh, a thing. Yeah. You know, I think um, it's, it's more of a um, uniting factor than it is a individual um, experience. Uh, I think that because we're all in one way, shape or form kind of conscious because we're tapped into this, um, or connected to, I think would probably be a better way to put it because we're connected consciously. Um, we, we are conscious, uh, but I think that when we, and that word think, I think is the problem, right? Because we do, you know, because yeah. we do think that, yeah. that, that pulls us sometimes apart from the, uh, collective, uh, unit, unifying aspect of, of, of consciousness. Um, and, and man, like that idea of that kind of separating ourselves through that process of thought and ownership and self. Um, another line from the Tao Te Ching, he's, he says, you know, um, most trouble comes because we have selves. If we had no selves, we would have no trouble. And it's just uh, this really interesting, like, yeah, and it, without that, we wouldn't have the joy that we also have present. So it's like this very delicate balance. Yeah. But I think you we have it. to, yeah, right. Yeah, totally. Yeah. And it's like, we have to find balance within that where yeah. we allow that unifying element of consciousness. We allow that in while also um, doing our best to be our best self, our best version of ourselves. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. Consciousness, I think is, is collective uh, unifying and not, uh, we have an individual line within it, an individual kind of connection to it, hmm. but it's a connection to a, a, a greater, yeah. not a, I like not that. A, not a, it's not like we're walking around in these little pods of, of consciousness. <laughs> right. you know I mean? Like, 
Um, everything's everything's sort of connected and it's on a giant highway and we're just one lane in that highway or yeah. one line in that highway or something. Yeah. It's a great, yeah, it's a great question. I love that. Um, and it, but it is in a, in a way, I think because each of us have different, uh, our experience of our experiences are different. The experiences though, they may be similar. Our experience of those experiences is, are different. And I think that those, um, those differences, those little experiential things uh, that cause us to ask existential questions, those kind of help us to craft how we experience consciousness. So it's like that element of it, I think, is very individual, very different. Yeah. But I think uh, consciousness as a general sense is the same. Kind of like you, you were saying, you know, you, when you're under anesthesia, it's like you're, you're, not, you're not awake. I don't know that you're not conscious, but I think you're not awake. I think that'd be fair. But then when you awake, when you wake up, it's like we just notice everything starts whizzing and clicking and doing as it's supposed to do, right? Yeah. The thing computer's back on. <laughs> yeah. It's like consciousness is kind of flooded back in. Yeah. You know, and it's yeah. like, well, now we know. Yeah. Right? Just where does it go? That's why I was like, well, you know, where does my conscious go? Is it go? Does it go anywhere? Is it just un, you know, sleeping with me, or you know, is it something else? But I do like this idea, uh, and that there's this unified, you know, I don't know, connection that we all have with one another, and probably other organic things, right? That's uh, that is unique, and and that, to me, this is what's fascinating about consciousness, and when when it's overlaid with things like quantum mechanics or quantum physics, where these are laws and rules that that define us now we don't fully understand them but they're they really sort of play off one another and um anyway i i don't want to get down the the quantum mechanics hole but um i just wanted to get your opinion on consciousness because um you know i figured you probably would have a take on it that i hadn't maybe thought of and, and in fact some some of the things are very similar so i appreciate i appreciate that from a from a deep thinker <laughs> yeah of course man and i appreciate the question was, uh, i love yeah i love that so as we sort of wind <laughs> wind toward the end of our our hour here um i want to ask you is there anything that i haven't asked you that you well there's two things anything i haven't asked you that you want to share that you think are that's important for people to know about just growth in general wellness in general um well as i'll just start with that question how about that um uh yeah i think the first thing that i want to make sure uh was clear in this in this conversation was um that uh growth and wellness are uh yours right whoever that yours it's everybody's um, and if we take the focus off of us, then I think we actually do ourselves a disservice. We have to be focused on us in this idea. Um, and if you know this from, from going through, and there's, there's a page in the student guide, it's 205 is the number, but there's three questions on that page. It says, yesterday I was, today I am, and tomorrow I will be. Right. Um, and you know, my wife's name is Stephanie. It doesn't say yesterday Stephanie was, yes, tomorrow, or today Stephanie is, tomorrow Stephanie will be. I, I can't do a damn thing about Stephanie. Yeah, I literally, I really can't. And if I thought I could, I'd be wrong. <laughs> and she would tell me to. <laughs> but it's like we have to keep the focus on us. You know, it's it, it, that's kind of the the beauty and the curse of of, of post-traumatic growth is that that trauma element of it that makes us feel very alone and makes it feel very about us. And the growth element of it too is ours. It's something that we have to do for us and for us only. Um, we can do it kind of, and Frankel says this, you know, I want you to, to go on to, you know, I want you to listen to what your conscience commands you to do and go on to carry it out to the best of your abilities. Um, and there's an element there that's, uh, for a cause greater than oneself or a person other than oneself. And that dedication for the work can be external. I dedicate the work to this external thing, but it's me that's doing the work. It's not, I'm not beholden to anyone else to do the work. I'm not giving Stephanie the opportunity to tell me when to do it or how to do it. It's me that has to decide 
I can dedicate this to Stephanie. I can dedicate this uh, to Bouldercrest. I can dedicate this to gentleness, to kindness, whatever I want to do. And if there's a religious element to whoever owns it, then do it. But the work has to be us. Mm -hmm. uh, that's number one. Um, number two, uh, kindness first. That's our first rule at PATH. It's personally, it's my first rule. Um, I think if more people went from kindness first, I think the world would change and it would change differently and dramatically. Um, that those two things I think are, are paramount. Number one, uh, do it for you and do it because of you. And you're the only one that can do it. And number two, um, just kindness first. Kindness to yourself and kindness to others. Uh, yeah, those two things I think would say. This idea of kindness is probably makes up about 90% of my conversation with my youngest son in the car as we drive to and from basketball all the time because we're in traffic, we're, you know, or someone's cutting us off. There's always something happening, right? And actually this was ha happened to us Thursday night. Some, we got behind someone who was going like 15 miles under the speed limit on a you know two-lane highway and I couldn't pass. <laughs> and I said something probably like this ridiculous driver, whatever. And then I realized he, he's listening to me. He's in the car with me. And so something I learned some time ago, probably a year and a half, two years ago, that I keep trying to go back to and it gets around, it gets around this idea of kindness is just presume positive intent. Presume when mm -hmm. someone's saying something or doing something that there's some positive intent and there might be some other, or there might seem be some alternative explanation. So that car, I don't remember what I said. It was something derogatory. And then I stopped myself and I said, you know what? <laughs> I, by now you've, I've told, I told him this literally, by now you've heard me say this a bunch of times. I'm working on getting better at this, right? I'm working on presuming positive intent. What I could have thought, that might've been an older driver in there. It was dark. This is a windy road. They're probably just trying to be safe. So they don't injure somebody or injure somebody else. You know, there's a million other reasons why they were going slow. I have no idea what they were, but right. we just, that was just me trying to put him in the same moment with me and go, okay, like there's a better way of thinking about this, but it's, it's almost innate to go like to the negative right away. Right. And, and it takes work. This goes back to the hard work to be kind is, is hard. And to presume that positive intent is hard. Um, so last, last question was, is there one thing that, uh, one takeaway from everything you've learned over the, since 2016, since you've made this transition that, that someone you know, someone could just start doing themselves like one skill, one thing, and maybe it is just take on kindness, but is there something that you're like, this is definitely the thing. If you can start doing this, you'll just get some momentum and get going and start moving forward, taking some action, those, you know, something like that. <laughs> can I beg a, a second? Can I ask for two? For sure. You could have three if you want. Okay. I'm drawing so a line just, at four. <laughs> <laughs> just need two, man. All right. Um, the, the first one, uh, be curious. Um, it, it doesn't matter uh, how you find wellness. It doesn't matter in what regard you seek health and balance and peace and, and joy. Seek it. And seek it out of the darkest corners of your world. Go to those places. Unearth what's there. If it's not valuable, go to another place. Just don't stop. Because uh, Frankel, he, he had this, this man who was estranged from his son. And the guy had written his son, he said, over 500 letters. And he goes to Frankel and he says, I can't write a single letter more. And Frankel says, well, what if you knew that the 503rd letter your son would write back? Would you stop now? And the man just kind of looked at Frankel. He was like, well, no, of course I wouldn't. He was like, so how do you know that it's not going to take hold next, next letter? We never know when we will truly experience the fruition of the work that we're putting in and the curiosity that we use to build it. So be curious, number one. Number two, uh, super simple practice. It's called gratitude. When I left PATH, uh, I, I'm an infantry Marine, so I have to... Um, I got to light the fires and burn the tires. You know, I got, I got to, I got to mess it up to prove it. And uh, I, I was initially, I, I kept doing everything I, I was taught. 
I did all the practices regularly, did them all every day. And I woke up and I just thought, how great am I? You know, what a, what a wonderful boy. Uh, and th- eventually it's like that kind of that, the new car smell wore off a little bit. <laughs> and I was like, you know what? It's like, I'm going to press cruise control. It's like, I don't need to meditate. It's like, I'll just do it once a day. I'll be fine. Uh, I don't need to really you know, share what I'm, what's going on. I don't need to disclose. Like I'm, I'm doing pretty good. I don't have a lot to disclose anyway. So I'll stop. And I gradually started stopping uh, doing all these things that I knew I needed to do. The one thing, interestingly enough, that I didn't uh, was gratitude. And I credit that practice for helping me to realize because I fell and I fell really hard, fell forward this time. I didn't fall back. Um, but I realized in that fall, that I, I just I had to keep doing these things. I, if I if the choice that I'm going to make is to live the life I deserve, uh, then I have to do these things. And I credit gratitude for making it a fall forward, not a not a fall down. Um, and what I say when I say practice gratitude is find a way, whatever way that is for you, uh, to track uh, maybe one thing, two things, maybe three things a day that you're very grateful for um, or grateful to. You can be grateful for or grateful to. Uh, the two kind of gives you a little bit more of a, a personal element to it, I've found. Okay. Um, and when I'm grateful to something, I, I write it out. You know, I am grateful to, obviously you start that sentence that way. Uh, and then whatever it is, let's just say, um, my one for this morning. Um, I'm very grateful to my body. Uh, because it grows in in very rapid ways and it heals very rapidly. That's that's my gratitude for this morning. Now the important thing is to tack on why. Why are you grateful for that? Because that kind of starts to really open it up in your mind. I'm grateful for that. I'm grateful to my body because that helps me to live longer hmm. with the woman who I want to spend the rest of my life with. Yeah. Right. It keeps me healthy. Um, so what are you grateful for and then why, and then track it somehow and, and try to find three per day. Um, the cool thing about this gratitude is that it doesn't uh, have a negative side effect, (laughs) Uh, (laughs) right? The worst thing that could happen is you get better, uh, which I think is a pretty good prognosis. Yeah. You Um, might, you might find you're grateful for the same thing twice in a six month period, right? Yeah, it's awesome. Um, Nothing wrong with it. Yeah, number one, be grateful. Uh, Number two, or number one, be curious. And then number two, be grateful. Yeah, and and, and adding the why. Yeah, that's a really good idea. And then adding why. And remember, two or four, either way, however you want to do it, I'm grateful for, I'm grateful to. Um, I think a lot, most of us just kind of think grateful for. Um, It's kind of we're given something, but grateful to. Uh, I think is more of a little bit of a supplication, a kind of a, an offer. Mm-hmm. So, I will put um, links to uh, Boulder Crest Foundation and Warrior Path and stuff in the show notes. But if someone is really interested in in attending, besides asking me and me telling them that they need to get their butt there, um, <laughs> how you know how would they go about? Just can they just go to the website and fill out a like an application? Yeah. So if you go to our website and you go underneath uh, programs, you know, up at the top where there's those, like, you'll see the kind of navigation bar, you'll see programs underneath programs. It says warriors. Uh, This is for combat veterans and first responders. Um, And then about a third of the way down the page, you'll see both of those links. One is the application for a first responder. The other one is uh, the application for a combat veteran. Um, But that's the application for warrior path. If you're looking to just come up and stay with us in our cabins, uh, those cabins open up for booking on the final Friday of every month at 4 p.m. Hmm. So the last Friday every month at 4 p.m., it opens up for the next three months. Okay. We book three months in advance. Um, So um, get on there quick if you want. Uh, because those things go literally within yeah. an hour. Um, I imagine they do because they're so nice and it's yeah. so beautiful up there. Beautiful, man. Um, last thing I wanted to, this is like the third last thing, um, <laughs> but it, it reminded me when I was saying I was going to put it in the show notes um, about, you know, I've, I've several people that I know that would benefit from from going to Warrior Path. I've suggested, hey, go 
go check out this website, you know, go fill out an application. And I get the same response that I had. And in fact, I probably get, I think I gave you the same response when you called me about going. Cause like my application had gotten lost in the mail, so, something happened and you called and it was like some months later, I had forgotten I even filled the thing out. Like I filled it out in a moment of weakness and, uh, and now Paul <laughs> Downs is calling me. Oh shit. And, um, but they, they said the same thing that I said to you. And I was like, well, I, you know, it's probably for someone else. I don't want to take somebody's spot. I don't want, you know, I don't, someone else probably more deserving than me. Um, just that sort of thing. Like, what would you say to that? Uh, well, <laughs> you know, there's this really uh, interesting truth that uh, at some point um, it's not chivalry anymore. Um, it's fear. And uh, when your turn comes at the front of the line, step up, you know, and if you've thought about it, and you've made it to the website, believe it or not, you're at the front of the line and it's your turn. So submit. Um, yeah, it might be very scary and you're not going to know exactly what you're getting into, but that's perfect because if you can see the path that you're on, it's not yours. If it's not seen, it's probably a good spot to start growing. Um, and this inferiority uh, will whisper to you, someone else deserves it more. Um, but it's your turn. You deserve it. You deserve mm -hmm. a, a life that's worth living. And, um, the growth that comes with that. So sign up. Yeah. Don't be robbed of your happiness. Go to warrior right. path. Yeah. yeah sure. Right. All right, brother. I, I appreciate it, man. I really do. Thanks for uh, all the advice. I learned something new again obviously. And, uh, I'm going to, I'm going to stay on this. I'm going to stay on this journey of consciousness, man. Yeah. Uh, I'm, uh, man. It, it keeps me curious. Yep. Maybe next time we'll talk about the difference between awareness and consciousness. That's just one podcast. I love it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Man, Gabe, thanks so much, brother, for having me on this thing. Like it's, um, it's a pleasure. It's a privilege to be able to kind of talk about this stuff and talk about it with you. Um, your uh, curiosity to try to uh, learn this and, and spread it and, and help people learn it as much as, as, as we have um, is the gift to be around. Man. So thank you so much for having me. It's, uh, it's been a pleasure. Well, to steal a line from Chick-fil-A, it's my pleasure. Beautiful. This is... The Foxhole Podcast.